Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker of today, Jelena Vesic. She is an independent curator, writer, editor, and lecturer. She is active in the field of publishing, research, and exhibition practice that intertwine political theory and contemporary art. Jelena edits and co-edits several journals and art magazines across Europe and curates and co-curates contemporary arts exhibitions and projects. Her latest one in collectivizing five stories just set up at the Modern Galleria in Ljubljana, deals with the feminist interventions, deals with the feminist interventions into the art historical narration on the, in the 20th century avant-garde art collectives. In addition to curation, Jelena's writing has been published in several publications, amongst them the essay book entitled On Neutrality, published as part of the Non-Alignment Modernity Edition by Mocha in Belgrade. Dear Jelena, a heartfelt welcome. Looking forward to hear your ideas, and the stage is yours. Hello, thanks. Uh, I wish uh, uh, it was a, some kind of plenary political meeting. Uh, it is not obligatory that I speak, but I wish, uh, you know, like it's a big hall and uh, some kind of plenary political meeting, but who knows, maybe one day we'll have, we'll have this as well. So, uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will speak today um, theoretically and um, also historically to... Um, reflects deeper upon the questions that have been discussed all of these days. Also, some of the questions were part of uh, beat of the theater plays, uh, maybe um, immediately um, and kind of explicitly of uh, the piece uh, uh, City Without uh, Women, the theater without the women. Uh, so these are the topics of artistic labor. What I'm going to do uh, is to uh, return to the research and text of mine that I uh, wrote some seven years ago, which is called uh, Administration of Aesthetics uh, and uh, on the undercurrents of artistic jobs, contracting artistic jobs between love and money, between money and love. So, uh, I will uh, discuss the figures of money and love as they play in uh, contemporary semi-capitalism, that means language and linguistics. I will analyze uh, this process from the perspective of uh, uh, the so-called, or what we refer to as independent cultural workers, so as mostly content makers, and I will uh, uh, show how these two figures uh, play in this field uh, and how they are actually connected with uh, uh, what I call, uh, referring to a friend of mine and former artist, Goran Djordjevic, ideology of art, because there is obviously uh, certain terrain, uh, which I think is uh, established in the moment when the institution of art is established, when the aesthetic is established, when the art is established as a separate sphere, or what we refer to as arts liberales. And uh, I think that uh, no matter how much uh, we as uh, critical art practitioners which most of us are, and uh, independent cultural workers, and of course the uh, neo-avant-gardist, alternativist, and so on, generations who worked before us, no matter how much uh, we made uh, a criticism to uh, 
uh, this very ground where art is established, so more or less the 18th century and the project of enlightenment, that we are still very much dependent uh, of that ground. So that ground, I mean, which <laughs> we also in a critical theory today uh, criticize uh, observing all these dark sides of modernity. So basically the question is whether there is a reason today in this kind of post-historical, post-knowledge and so on world to defend the project of modernity. And me, uh, as for me, I'm a practitioner and a theorist and uh, this uh, uh, thesis or this talk that I uh, was thinking to share with you today, uh, interconnects my experience of organization and uh, cultural political labor on uh, the um, grand organization that we had here, infrastructure, the process of instituting, the organization of the other scene in Belgrade, which uh, encompassed a lot of uh, uh, cultural and activist uh, initiatives and collectives, and also need to theoretically uh, reflect uh, our position to understand it better in, uh, social, uh, in social sense and uh, in a theoretical sense. So, as I said, I'm both theorist and practitioner, and uh, so in this, uh, uh, but, but, but in a way, uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not that much uh, of an academic person, which is, of course, uh, in this kind of mid-career, uh, a problem, <laughs> and I uh, discussed, uh, I mean, I, I, I had a chat with the previous keynote, my friend uh, Tom Meddock, uh, we confessed to each other, I mean, it was more confession of mine, I confessed that uh, I have a problem with this uh, PhD academic, and I uh, told him how uh, actually I was always ashamed to put this PhD uh, next, to, next to my name, punkishly, as a... Uh, uh, always connected to independent uh, to independent scene, and then observing my uh, later uh, reflections, I connected to uh, the uh, one uh, theoretical and pra practical concept that has been um, also recently uh, excavated by some friends and co-thinkers. The term of uh, situated uh, knowledge by Donna Haraway, which is already uh, which is already uh, established in uh, 1988. In 1988. I always want to say 1989 because it is a very symbolic uh, year for uh, also this conversation. So uh, the situated knowledge uh, for me always meant delineating, uh, possibility to delineate my own speaking position uh, with also bodily presence and with certain exposure uh, of vulnerability and openness uh, to self-questioning vis-a-vis an academic uh, institutionalized uh, certainty. Situated the knowledge uh, problematizes view from above, from nowhere, the perspective of observation that under the guise of neutrality presents itself as universal by hiding very specific position behind, which is quite often, of course, a male, white, heterosexual, human, and so on. Such view is claimed to have the capacity to see, but to remain unseen itself. It, it represents, while escaping representation, we can have, yeah, the next slide. This is it, this is the slide. Harvey uh, wrote how feminist analysis, which of course, uh, makes it feminist and justifies uh, the needs for such an analysis, attempts to recognize how power works and how situated knowledges open themselves for new, unexpected, and of and surprising forms of uh, knowledge production. 
So situated knowledge opens the passage between the theory and practice. It shows how body matter, how context matters, and how theory is part of life, how cognitive processes are also body processes. It gives this uh, possibility to disclose the figure of I, like I am speaking from this place, from this body, from this experience, and I'm uh, exposing these weaknesses, uh, this strength, uh, possibilities, impossibilities. I'm trying to think. Each idea has its limitations. Ideas are vulnerable. I belong to the first generation of independent cultural workers. We can have the next slide. Active in this region, the so-called freelancers in the official theory of management. Flexible personas, as Brian Holmes reflected upon the idea some decade ago or more. Precariat, another spreading term, which uh, is much larger and encompasses much larger field of production than culture itself and is very much connected to this uh, post fordist uh, model that, again, Tom Maddock has spoken more about in relation to dance. And uh, projectariat, which is perhaps the most important term for me, and which has been reflected by a colleague, Kuba Schroeder, in his recently published book, ABC of Projectariat. The work of my generation was framed by the dissolution of Yugoslavia and dissolution of the institutional and infrastructural system of the socialist social state based on the principles of self-management and associated labor, great theoretically elaborated and applied practically with some problems that have been analyzed um, in social theory. And I can mention here many of the valuable books, but they won't because uh, I would like to save some time for the conversation, for the discussion. My generation of independent cultural workers returned critically to the heritage of Yugoslav socialist modernist project and tried to apply some positive aspects of it in the contemporary practice. We fought against neoliberalism, that is, against the false premises of the so-called democratic regime that allegedly replaced Milosevic's nationalist politics and war mogulism. So we fought against the false promise of better life after the end of wars and arrival of democracy, the so-called normal life. We can have the next slide. But normality is a capitalist invention. It is an ideologically loaded word, although it might not seem like that at the first glance. The normalization of former Eastern Europe after 1989 assumed a transitional stage in which society and individuals who are making this society have to pass through a certain period of disciplinary transformation following the prescribed norms of Western capitalist normality. such are transformation of the state and public property into private property, transformation of the public space into the private one, industrialization and mercantilization of every aspect of life and work, commodification of living spaces, of the common urban spaces in which people used to meet and talk without the mediation of capital. This is uh, why the title of this EITM meeting, Work Hard, Live Harder, sounds both opportune and impossible, utopian. I would like to understand it as a political demand, the one which suggests that life should not, should be, with the one which suggests that the life should be separated from capitalist production. How? if today we speak about life work as a continuum, life dash work. If life and work are entwined, if living hard is not an experience, a bliss of life as such, but a representation, a flow of images of internet, a lucrative job of influencers who live the hardest, who are fittest to survive in the representation of life on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Pinterest, together with many others who compete for attention. 
do I live hard enough? In this network of self-representing, in this hard work of presenting how we live harder than others, we are becoming more and more sad, sad by design, as media theorist Hert Loving would put it. But the system requests normalization, normality, so those who work hard and live harder sometimes cannot, but must, because show must go on. So, antidepressants. In the panel a week ago, one speaker confessed, I'm taking antidepressants, but you know, I pee, I shit, so my excrements together with antidepressants are going into water, into soil. They infuse fish, vegetable, or that we eat. All food is full of antidepressants. Oh, this is why we are so normal, I thought. I belong to the first generation of post-Yugoslav cultural workers who graduated from high school and faculty during Yugoslav wars in the 90s, the wars that still don't have a proper name. Anti-Yugoslav wars can be one of descriptive names since they destroyed all the structures, political horizons, and human relations built through Yugoslav post-war socialist period, such as, we can have a next slide, thank you such as the politics of workers' self-management, public property, not private, not, nor state, but public, social care, like free education for all, free health medical services, free holidays in workers' and students' holiday houses on sea coasts and mountains, autonomous position in block division of the world with building the non-aligned movement. I belong to Yugoslav and post-Yugoslav generation, to socialist and post-socialist generation, to generation of 20, 20th and 21st century, to pre-internet and post-internet generation. I'm half-half. I have two brains, two minds, two hearts, two nervous systems, two confronted ways of thinking. I'm bipolar. Psychologically, I or we, my generation, in the early stage of life and the primary school, which is very important stage of political formation, are formed, and this is also something that uh, the very image, which is part of uh, the banner of this, uh, of, this of this conference in a way implies and announces, we are formed psychologically on a certain shock labor, like a collective voluntary working actions. Okay, I don't understand this idea of shock labor uh, as a kind of socialist uh, propaganda connected to the project of modernization, which it was as well. I rather understand it in a Leninist sense as increase social responsibility and the will to learn and self-improve continuously, which is, I think, embedded in this, uh, in this image uh, uh, showing um, of the conference, so, uh, work hard, uh, live harder, which uh, is showing the uh, brigades of uh, young uh, uh, shock laborers or uh, uh, voluntary uh, brigades who uh, are in the process of collective labor for uh, better now, for common good, for better tomorrow, and so on. Okay, I'm speaking about some premises, uh, psychological, that we had in our childhood, and which I think uh, very much built our personalities, and which we, which we kind of... Um, uh, processed uh, intellectually and as cultural laborers uh, in, the, in, in the later stage of our life. And the other thing uh, can be called, uh, which influenced our psychology in this early stage, can be called the partisan ethics, uh, like uh, the ethics of uh, solidarity, just struggle, help to the weaker, dedication to the higher common goals, mutual support, sharing knowledge and resources, fighting for autonomy and justice. With this psychological construction and ethics, my generation of independent cultural workers, 
independent because it didn't want to join the national and often nationalist institutions which adopted new managerial competitive logic as a part of the so-called democratic changes after Yugoslav wars, but wanted to act autonomously, creating parallel cultural stream, we called it other scene. With psychological construction of self-improving hard laborers and just enthusiasts, we paved the way to capitalist transition with our bodies. Internally, we fought against the capitalist expansion and created a blueprint for different instituting of culture, cultural policies and activism, both in theory and practice. We can have the next slide, thank you. Other scene initiated in 2005 was encompassing more than 70, 70 organizations of feminist activists, artistic groups, theater and dance groups, theoretical journals, activist groups, film groups, alternative media and education collectives, internet activists, hackers and pirates. And internally we fought against this expansion and for some ideas, while well, externally, since the ideological apparatus is a heavy structure and sometimes falls over bodies and desires like heavy cover or top, which we in theory also call ideological overdetermination, we bridged the gap between the vanishing socialist infrastructure and capitalist structure in making or becoming with our bodies with our enthusiasm, which in the capitalist conditions operates as self-exploitation. We struggled to show how, uh, we, we struggled to show how actually uh, immaterial labor, which was the key term of our times, uh, actually contains in itself certain materiality, which is why the art is labor. We wanted to show that loving your work or labor or uh, love labor, the labor of love in a broader sense, should be recognized as work and receive some remuneration like salary for life, universal basic income. We thought of these things already in early 2000s. All the infrastructures we have built are erased in the belated by, but very hard, harder wave of budget cuts after the financial crisis in Europe in 2008, which hit the periphery of EU, the former Yugoslav region, so strongly, resulting in cutting almost entire independent cultural sector. Many actors emigrated from the country. Many couldn't continue to do previous work. Many became, became seriously depressed or sick. Many collectives fell apart. All the structures we made dissipated in this process. So this reflection between love and money stems from these struggles. And I try to articulate the specificity of um, our project-based independent cultural labor and to articulate its apparatus, the apparatus of production. The, the title also contains uh, the notions of administration of artistic jobs in this foggy zone of hard work and harder life that operates between love and money, money and love. Mm. Okay, I have to check slides later. Uh, okay, now a little bit of history. I hope you will not fall asleep. How love and money are historically confronted in the history of social and in the way state institution of art. Why art is represented as more about love and less about money. Although it is very much about money when we enter the conversations about star system or the figure of artists as an operative ideal for the figure of cool businessmen such as Zuckerberg, Elon Musk and other techno feudals. 
And now we can have Francisca next slide. Thank you. The institution of art built in the project of European modernity appropriated the divine prerogative of creation, creation. But at the same time, it used that same prerogative to open up the space for denying material body, the artist's life, something that critical art practice would file under artistic work or artistic labor or the social function of art. In the concept of creation and creativity, uh, which are the key elements uh, uh, of uh, uh, ideology of art. In this ideological narrative, the work is replaced by free and almighty flow of inspiration of the artist's genius, while the work of art is solely defined by immunity or the author's trademark, uh, like uniqueness, singularity, originality. And precisely in the concepts of authorship and originality, in the contrast between the divine attribute of creation, creatio, and the uh, worldly profane production, productio, lies the ideological opposition between arts and goods, which has been constantly and confidently perpetuated by the institution of art. So we have in a previous theory this idea of art world uh, uh, made by Arthur Danto, um, which is um, very, uh, which very much determined uh, uh, the art of 60s and, and 70s and understanding of it and is a reflection of the art of 60s mostly. Then the, uh, we have this idea of artistic uh, labor as um, free, autonomous labor that uh, is opposing uh, the wage labor, classical, classical labor. So the idea of art as free labor, which is when the art is understood as creation, as creatio, as this divine, divine, uh, divine prerogative. In the contemporary enterprise culture, Art is almost never represented as market, not even when it uh, has been nominally, legally, and institutionally constituted as market. Example, such as Freeze Art Fair in London. We can have next slide, thank you. A manifestation that, without any doubts, exhausts its function and meaning in art sales and trades, although its self-representation refers to something completely different. And we can have next slide. In the function of representation and experience, this manifestation frequently employs vast symbolic capital of communication, aesthetization, intellectual work, creativity, and finally money, in order to dissuade visitors, art lovers, collectors, and even actors in this operation, at least for a moment that it is all just about money and goods. I observed this phenomenon as a distance reflex of truths rooted in modern aesthetics and history of art in the moment of establishing the academia and art as an institution. The 18th century academy, art academy, provided lessons on distinction between high art and its public function and commercial art as the synonym for the law. That heritage, I claim, has more or less played constitutive function for the institution of art in all its lat later stages of um, self-transformation. So, next slide. The uh, examples uh, are numerous. Uh, in example, Giorgio Vasari, one of the first um, we say art historian, so the, who wrote this uh, life of uh, most famous painters, sculptors, and architects, Levite, uh, in Italian, in uh, uh, 1550, uh, underline all the time this idea of perfection, then Wil Winkelmann, who dealt with modernity and antiquity with the history, 
uh, in visual representation, uh, called this connection between antiquity and modernity as no noble simplicity and quiet grandeur. Denis Diderot, who reviewed the Paris uh, Salon, which is uh, uh, an institution that's uh, preceding uh, the formats of um, uh, biennial exhibitions today, which are grand art institution of today, he uh, was mentioning uh, the terms such as corruption uh, of taste by luxury or money that is throwing both arts. Then Joshua Reynolds, one of the founders of the British Academy, uh, observed the, the very art attributes as a kind of intellectual dignity, which, as he says, ennobles the painter's art and draws the line between him and pure mechanic, who does not produce art but mere ornament. So we see how this idea of uh, public art, which is not mere decoration, which is not, uh, which is not uh, merely uh, something something that's, that's that's useful, which is also not craft. Uh, they would insist on it, but is a kind of intellectual dignity is made for public good or state good is very, like ideologically representative. So we see in these examples how the uh, how the true art. Okay, in the quote marks, how the true art has historically uh, has historically uh, divorced uh, divorced from uh, from money from this kind of um, uh, remuneration. Okay, <laughs> so uh, thank you. I think. This was for the previous, for control of the previous slides. Now, uh, uh, in such contrasting, antagonistic, and variable attempts to remove money, labor, and labor relations from the stage of art representation, there are obvious consensual efforts to explain that art cannot be understood as business as usual, as labor and work, but rather as something completely different. And this is uh, in the very in the very structure of art, in the very in the very in the very history of art. If we observe like contemporary uneasiness or the number of paradoxes that are stemming from this, like in example, the other day, the speaker was uh, telling how uh, a Greek uh, a cultural minister uh, uh, spoke about art uh, as uh, something that uh, lives in a uh, gray zone. And he is right in a way, I mean, theoretically, though he obviously uh, uses, uh, uses this ambiguity for, uh, uh, for propagandistic reasons, for, uh, bad political, for bad political reasons. And we can have next slide, please. Now, how this relates to the case experience of the other scene and the labor of independent content producers. I wanted to investigate uh, in this uh, research the very, pr the very production apparatus of the project-based practice, and I spoke about projectariat and projectization, to try to get closer to the economic reality of workers active in ever-expanding world of art in all its domains of self-critical negation, transformation, uh, excesses, inclusions, exclusions, I wanted to focus on the very moment when projects and collaborations come into life and to explore the modes of production which are uh, established by means of language and communication. So I mentioned at the beginning this semi-capitalism, the term that Franco Berardi Bifo has often written about. So I focused on the uh, agreements on art, content production uh, of independent cultural labor, uh, which is often uh, funded in peer-to-peer -peer basis agreements that are unofficial and paralegal. The moment of negotiation about the delivery of content or participation in various cultural events. 
So these production forms of the independent cultural sector are precisely laid out through this paralegality, uh, through the relationship one-to-one, -one, whereas the institutional officialdom, legal verification of agreement comes as an administrative confirmation of something that has already happened. I was interested in the dramaturgy of the processes of contrasting works in art, contracting works in art, in the context of independent cultural labor. I was interested in the field operated by protagonists who live at the bottom of the economic ladder of enterprise culture. Freelance writers, guest lecturers, experimental curators, critically oriented visual artists, left-wing intellectuals, alternative theater companies, independent critics. In other words, all those who answer to various institutional calls or to the calls of independent organizations, so peer-to-peer. -peer. In this text, Between Love and Money, I tried to dramatize these two figures in a characteristic communication schemes. My story was about culture workers who collaborate in various self-organized initiatives behind the curtains of immediate production of glamour and success. The subjects that Gregory Chalet calls dark matter in the sense of their voluntary political decision to leave the place with the most exposure and immediate connection with the star system and market demands. It is in this adventure of going down to the field of production or a kind of scenario overview where every similarity with the real actors is intentional, the accent is put on several types of paracontractual relations in which the relations between love and money, play and labor. These are two, uh, this, is, this, is two this is the second um, comparative uh, binum. And here I'm trying to uh, think in not binomial way, but in a kind of more differentiated and, uh, and, uh, and more um, nuanced uh, uh, non-binary uh, logic. So, however, we have these figures, love and money, play and labor, which are uh, appearing in the speech registry, where we uh, always uh, have uh, one person who is a content maker and uh, another person who is organizer, which I signed with the A, A and B letters. And we can have the next slide. So uh, these are some um, dramat dr dr dramaturgical uh, examples, uh, which are, I don't know, more, maybe more real than reality, in which I'm trying to uh, catch some of the uh, phrases uh, which are occurring in uh, communication and how this uh, actually uh, language of uh, love uh, dominates in the, in, the, in the process, in the very process of contracting artistic works uh, 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 in the case of content makers and independent cultural scene. So you have these terms uh, like to, will you join me, you were chosen, uh, uh, you are the only one, you are invited, uh, I only want to do this with you, uh, looks more as an invitation to love affair than as a... Uh, uh, process uh, in which uh, we should contract uh, the work. And then uh, we have answers of the two uh, content makers uh, in which they emphasize different things. Uh, in the first in the first uh, in the first case, the person uh, the person doesn't want to talk about budget, but uh, content uh, says writing should not be a profession, and I'm not doing this because of money, but because it makes sense for society. So confirmation of this uh, uh, logic uh, of art that should always be a public good, and that is very much uh, close to uh, uh, what I uh, said, uh, what I spoke about, Danny Diderot, like corruption of uh, real art by money and so on and so forth. So, but B2, uh, who is a person who still tries to make a living, but is not uh, uh, questioning this dialogue, which I call uh, this, uh, this scheme of the letter, I called it parade of ladies and gentlemen, or nobility without the protection, because 
because everyone is consensual about how it is not nice to mention uh, the uh, word money or fee or something like that. So uh, the B2 person uh, who is uh, eager in actually knowing uh, also about this uh, fee thing uh, will uh, um, use uh, that uh, quite often the terms which are implying organization, like can you tell me something about organizational details, uh, maybe I'm interested in the production, more about the whole project, uh, can you tell me something about the whole project, about the conditions, etc., etc. But they are expressing themselves in the language of love, in the language of creatio, creation, because no, art should not be a production. Then the, uh, the second case, which I uh, uh, call a tripartite uh, letter, short reckonings make long friends, and uh, this tripartite letter is uh, more or less naturalized as a canonical form of conversation about contracting in terms of um, engaging artistic work, and the obligations, of course, are moral, collegial, and, and reputational. Uh, and such letters usually involve the three information blocks. First the, is the information on the content, content and scope of the project. Second is the information about the nature and scope of in involvement, place, and time of the content delivery. And third is information on the fee. So the letter of the person who invites in this kind of dramaturgical uh, format, which I made on the, ba on the base of real practice, may sound something like DRXXX, I received your contact details from YYY. Are you interested in writing a text uh, uh, concerning the topic of MMM for ZZZ magazine? Kindly find attached the concept in attachment you find something like which is very brief and general description. Uh, the text should have uh, X to Y words. The length of the text is strictly limited. Unfortunately, the deadline is tight. This is what we hear most of the times. All texts uh, should have to be ready no later than uh, 001 date. In case you are interested in cooperation, kindly, kindly send us the draft of your text uh, by the end of the week. So. <laughs> Then from this letter, you, one can see, uh, one can see, uh, or can you, you can read it further, and one can see that uh, uh, I receive your contact details from YYY, uh, and the short deadline, this usually means that uh, you are not the first invited uh, person to do that, but uh, uh, who knows, maybe third, second, fourth. Uh, who is uh, uh, recommended uh, by somebody else, and which is why the deadline is uh, is so is so short. So, and here we have uh, the two uh, pro, uh, the two uh, content makers, uh, the two different type of co content makers, B1 and B2. So, uh, B1 can think. Uh, for themselves uh, or discuss with friends uh, on the base of this letter, which is very clear uh, and uh, very rational. But uh, uh, this may also uh, cause different feelings. In case of B1, uh, uh, the person who is also kind of rational uh, and maybe cynical in a way, uh, would say eventually, I really prefer working for capitalists. At least everything is clear. What you see is what you get. They exploit clearly and publicly and not under the table like state institutions or our friends who always negotiate also in this uh, language, langu la language of love, which, uh, um, uh, okay, can have um, and does have much of the good political uh, possibilities and connotations, but is also uh, quite often uh, uh, used as a tool of self-exploiting. So uh, the person, the person B, is uh, one of those who is uh, again defending the institution of art and uh, its um, nobility. I hate when. Uh, uh, someone talks to me like this, uh, as writing a piece of text would be twisting screws. This is an intellectual humiliation. Uh, as if writing is not the most important part of magazine production and so on and so forth. And then uh, what, uh, uh, and we can have next slide, thank you. 
uh, and then uh, and then I have uh, one longer letter, which is, which is more or less the example of communication, like more warm communication, friendly communication, etc., which is uh, I think happening most of the times on uh, this uh, independent uh, independent scene. Uh, in which case the response of B uh, would be mostly direct ref reflection of the text A, uh, and they do share information about the context uh, of production, about some details, and uh, of K, okay, this is also warm and friendly understanding and so on. But uh, still, uh, there, is, there are these things on one side, on another side, so on one side, uh, such process can be perceived from the perspective of power from the uh, recognition of the effects of suprastate ideological apparatuses that uh, project work is exposed to, like international foundations, project networks, etc., and their sub subordination to totalizing tendencies of neoliberal social order. In this case, uh, such a paracontract would mean an uh, Consensual agreement of A and B to be beaten by the hand of humanism, a kind of warmer but also creepier version of the previous model. And this extending hand of beating flexible uh, work comes from restrictive uh, scheme of the project form. And uh, the project form is really key uh, for us uh, ideologically, which is characterized by lack of available time, tight uh, deadlines, competitive networking, and self-precarization. You yourself precarize yourself. You do these things. And this is somehow what the project form implies, because it also has its canons. In project forms, individuals put themselves into cooperation and interdependence, determine and reduce their own incomes, while the factor of modern technology speeds up communication and production. The number of projects increases, as well as the amount of work, while the fees are decreasing. So, and I'm mentioning again uh, this, uh, this book, uh, ABC of Projectariat, by my colleague Kuba Schroeder, who analyzes these things in greater details. On the other side, so to uh, finish uh, with uh, maybe a little, bit, uh, a, li a little bit of hope, but I would like to stay in this field of ambivalences, individuals in this context of production do have certain autonomy in project management. They have the opportunity to intervene in the field where worker does not apply working conditions, but the working conditions apply the worker, and to convert this classical form of suppression into its opposition. A good manager, like a train switchman, is in the position to reroute the paths and direct the movement toward tendency into another direction. And we can remember the character of diversant in partisan movies or in some kind of revolutionary movies. The possibility of intervention and action now opens towards a wider community as well and refers to collectivist, more democratic model or approach. Love would be unifying element of such collectivization. And here we can find the particle uh, uh, which uh, is uh, as a thought brought by revolutionary feminism. And this is an attempt to create micro communities, modern cooperatives in which interpersonal working and social relations are organized differently. In her time, Alexandra Kolontai, a Bolshevik feminist was inviting for a certain parallelism, a simultaneous construction of both new social apparatus and uh, of, uh, of change, and the change of personal and interpersonal relationships, believing that the end of capitalism lies not only in the abstract organization of the state apparatuses and laws, but also in is concentrated uh, and organized effort to transform personal and interpersonal relationships. Certainly, Kolontai linked these issues to the question of emancipation of uh, women and socializ uh, so socialization of childcare, 
But I believe the request for a change of social relations on a molecular level of interpersonality can be set as a universal request through a transformation of human consciousness. And this invitation can be also seen as an invitation to revolutionize relationships based on peer-to-peer -peer in line with the struggle for integral social, social change. So I do think both this as a positive note and the first as a, uh, as a thing that uh, really uh, limits us, the projects, the project-based structure, and that really has its uh, ideology and, um, uh, and uh, uh, its kind of conquering, uh, conquering uh, uh, logic. And okay, the last slide. So, uh, this last slide uh, is, uh, okay, a uh, well-known meme, but uh, I was thinking that it is interesting to kind of return to it in this uh, context of uh, work hard, uh, live harder, and uh, in regard to uh, uh, the reality of body in that body and psyche. So, thank you, and... Uh, I'm uh, uh, open to your comments, questions, what do we do, and so on. Maybe maybe people are hungry. I'm also fine if there is no uh, if there is no question. I'm open I'm open for discussions, but I also I don't insist on uh, discussion. I believe uh, I believe in the notion of. Delayed, uh, also delayed, uh, delayed thoughts, delayed delayed discussions. Uh, not everything has to be like really uh, fulfilling the form, but if you have some questions or especially comments or especially other ideas, I'm here. Also, oh, here we have one hand. Hi, thank you very much. I'm thinking and delaying a lot right now. What do you think we need to learn to change this? To do a step forward? Because it, it was really interesting for me. And I say, okay, I'm totally into this. How can I break the circle? Uh, if I if I if I had uh, if I had an answer to that uh, uh, question, I I wouldn't uh, have a necessity to <laughs> talk about uh, all this. I think in this uh, in this in this moment, I don't know. I mean, uh, um, in a in a in a style in a context of uh, situated knowledge, uh, we can also we can also be frank. So, uh, the, my, mm, my, my feeling is that uh, reality struck us uh, very, very strongly, so that in a way, uh, our entire paradigm in, we, in which we all are with this uh, critical art, uh, like inhabited uh, with all these serious 
questions, like really pregnant with questions and uh, ideas and desires and uh, projects and uh, content and the terms and everything. Uh, I think that in a way uh, it's already, um, or it's kind of doomed to death, to death. Uh, maybe it's replaced by something else, I don't know. Today uh, I'm uh, uh, signing myself as a cultural worker while my nephew who is doing special effects and uh, earns well from that, he signs himself as an artist. So I wonder, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like we are more or less the audience here mid-career generation and there are new things uh, that are coming. And I think that in these new things that are coming, uh, the new, um, the new more industrialized uh, con concepts of art um, are replacing, um, our forms of artist thinking as differentiation, also theory, uh, explanation. Tell me precisely how this thing is. This is our question. Well, the question for uh, uh, younger generations is uh, obviously something else. It is not a question. I mean, as far as I uh, had a chance to observe, it is more like see this, see that, see this, see that, and so on. So uh, accumulation of sensations, okay, we are also exposed to, to, to this as well, which makes us uh, bipolar because uh, we try to think, but we also try to see this, that, and to be uh, fast enough. So I don't know, uh, maybe uh, uh, we should uh, uh, more seriously reinvent the entire field or, uh, or we die, I mean, as a paradigm. Okay, we die definitely as human beings, but uh, but uh, but I think as a paradigm because they wonder what we are what we are now speaking about. Uh, okay, art as kind of public good as uh, something that's uh, part of uh, public as this this need that when you when you do something when you uh, write about something when you reflect when you research when you make an artwork uh, a piece uh, you dance and so on. You try to address this to, I don't know, society. You are not doing this because, just because of yourself, uh, your selfish self, but uh, uh, it is embedded in our art practice that it is for some kind of public. So without this uh, horizon, somehow the very paradigm uh, through which we act does not exist in a way. And uh, I wonder in which situation we are now today, whether this entire like artistic uh, intellectual um, uh, paradigm is just another bubble of reality. Like, okay, you have, uh, you have this bubble, uh, I don't know, of people who believe, who believe uh, in creationism, you have this bubble of uh, people who, uh, I don't know, love cats, and you have this bubble of people who are interested in uh, art and theory and so on. I wonder whether it is today our situation, which may, which may be the case. Okay, now I'm speaking to you the most extreme thoughts I have, which is may, not, not pedagogical, but okay. I'm not a pedagog. Okay? Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I have one comment and one doubt to throw in, if I may. Um, so first, uh, thanks for all that. Uh, but um, I wanted to say also when you talk about the love and you gave those examples of writing, um, I also see this and it's interesting uh, that you kind of uh, explained it to me in a way, uh, something that I started to perceive that like, I'm not sure if um, any of you encountered this, but also in now in receiving emails that say no to your application, this love language is employed, mm -hmm. um, which I find very interesting and very frustrating uh, because sometimes I, uh, I actually, after reading an email, I'm not sure if they said no or yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. s you know, and I have to, I feel almost forced to feel for them, um, although they are in a position of power in a certain way. 
uh, so just to say, like, if you do that, please don't, uh, <laughs> because it's somehow it's strange. It's it's weird. It's producing something strange. Uh, and the other thing is that I'm I mean ju I'm just thinking also because from the artistic position, I'm kind of curious in the form that you used for the presentation and and how this also immobilizes us as an audience. Um, so I want to throw a doubt about the meme, and it's not a critique, it's really a doubt that I'm also struggling with, uh, because maybe some of you know a very viral thing now in dance, performing arts field is a somatic-based content, which is the Instagram account, which is very uh, popular, and it's already, for example, in Poland, we have on, on now the, uh, the Polish version of it uh, that is getting a, a kind of notori notoriety. Um, but then I'm thinking, and this is a discussion I have with my colleagues, is the meme enough, you know? Or is it like, what is it that it's produced that like we can immediately recognize ourselves through certain uh, images and we can laugh at it, but then I think, taking an example of like somatic-based content, that it's, um, first of all, it's quite elitist, I think, uh, sometimes, to refer to certain notions that are shared only by a specific group of people. But then I'm also thinking if the memes, more in a cultural way also, like as a, as a certain culture of the meme, and in terms of like uh, signal, signaling certain political problems, is it not preventing us from actually digging deeper into certain things? Which I'm not saying with, with you, but like I'm mm -hmm. just thinking because even uh, looking at this image, I'm like thinking. But what's uh, no like if if it also allows us to to kind of uh, love? But then what I feel, if I would be honest with you, like I love, but I feel despair looking at it, you know, and I feel profoundly sad and disturbed. So. Also how to reckon with this and how to, because I think it's also a certain sign of times that, uh, that this sort of form of communication is proliferating. And then I, I wonder what are the challenges and, and also the dangers and, and kind of staying with, with that medium, for example. Mm. Okay, I see, I see uh, your comment more as a reflection than as a, than a, than a question. Uh, maybe what uh, what was a bit uh, under the under the question was this question of uh, of a meme um, and how and how it operates. Okay, uh, you you said yourself uh, how greatly the meme op operates, uh, but you also pointed to the second thing, which I would just agree with uh, that. Uh, 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 that the meme uh, quite often uh, um, induces this um, laughter, ha ha ha, or some kind of you know like re reaction which stands from recognition. You immediately recognize something. You see illusion basically in it, uh, and then this is the end of your of your of your labor it does not uh, it, it does not leave you, leave you to think it does not uh, inspire you to think further uh, um, it is also it is also a view with which uh, i can ag agree uh, just agree and uh, what i can uh, what i can say that for me it uh, uh, it draws its uh, criticality and uh, why uh, this is why laughter uh, maybe or some kind of reaction uh, is provoked uh, uh, similar so criticality similar to the process of I don't know appropriation art and so on in the 80s and uh, uh, that it, that it has been a lot of interpretative mechanisms and uh, thoughts employed around the analysis of uh, appropriation art in the 80s uh, uh, so meme has to do uh, with uh, with uh, with this with this logic. Uh, on on the other on the other hand, uh, somehow uh, uh, knowledge today uh, and uh, political responsibility is uh, quite often uh, replaced uh, by uh, uh, by cynicism. And uh, meme is uh, one of uh, the grandest conveyor of uh, of this logic, especially on the right. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is maybe a little bit more extended comment to meme that uh, 
uh, structured around uh, what you already said, but I agree. For your context and my context, I think the response to the conundrum that you pose in the end, no? how do we get out of the project horizon has been collectivized. No? And uh, you create collective structures and you create just a different division of uh, roles and uh, capacity of sort of resilience and resistance to uh, the division that is imposed by project work. The problem is that that strategy requires one to continue scaling, to, to kind of be able to contest the, the context in which one works and exists. That can be political context in the most immediate sense. And I feel that in here in, in, in Belgrade, in Serbia, that political context has in many ways crushed uh, in independent culture uh, in the way that it hasn't managed in Zagreb. So I was, I just wanted to hear your thoughts about it. Now you, you spoke in the beginning about the second uh, scene, Druga Sena, and how that uh, is now kind of thing of a past. So I'm, I'm, I would just be curious to pick your brain around what you think about collectivizing now, I guess, 10 years down the line? Mm. I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, uh, okay, this is, this, uh, uh, if I, if, if I, uh, I, I first uh, here, uh, the, uh, there is this big, this big difference in the, in the very uh, social structure uh, of, of Belgrade and Zagreb, which shapes, uh, institutions, decision, uh, decision bodies, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, what, I know, what I also noticed, there is also like a bit uh, dif different spirit. I think that here we, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, like a kind of scandalous that I would say this, but I really do think uh, so that we, uh, exaggerated in exercising of self-criticism as well in this uh, in this process of instituting the independent culture so um, uh, I, I, I I always uh, I always use used to say and I have uh, spoken about that uh, the other day with uh, Mariano and of, of the co-organizers of this conference how uh, we uh, remembered how I used to I used to say all the time I don't want to go you know like to city hall to talk to these people because I don't want to you know like teach capitalists how to become better capitalists you know like more right more uh, kind of uh, uh, precise intellectual and blah 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 but uh, less uh, you know, and less sloppy in this uh, Serbian sense you know like kind of more. Uh, uh, more uh, literate uh, in a sense of uh, uh, Brussels and less uh, uh, less sloppy and um, um, bohemian in a sense of you know like uh, Belgrade type of, of organization. So I think that the difference uh, that uh, independent cultural workers to capture through other initiatives in uh, in Zagreb managed to do more for independent cultural scene, but it is also part of uh, of this uh, uh, political uh, political structure, which is that you that you may uh, that you manage somehow to at least at the level on the level of city of Zagreb to bring another kind of uh, political breath, which is you know like very very stinky here for years. Uh, with a like a heavy uh, heavy right wing, and we we can't we can't do much. Uh, it's a big uh, it's big corruption. Uh, it's uh, it's also like more um, it's, it's bigger system, like more more differentiated system. And as self critique, I would say, uh, as self critique of myself now, I would say that uh, that uh, I was uh, really one of the. Um, har one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, harbingers, one of the heralds of this uh, uh, expansionist, uh, uh, unnecessary self-criticism, which we used to uh, 
exercise a lot. And also the second thing is uh, fractionism, which is quite often the, uh, the, the malad of uh, the left. Uh, and the end. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.